Are you ready? It's that time! It's time for this week's Parsha Podcast, everyone's favorite time of the week. Well, actually, of course, Shabbos is everyone's favorite time of the week. But the favorite non-Shabbos time of the week is right here, right now, the Parsha Podcast, coming to you from Houston, Texas, in the glorious Torch Center. And I want to tell the audience that I actually had a nightmare last night. The nightmare was that it was Sunday, and I had forgotten to record this week's Parsha podcast, and that would be a disaster. It would mean that the streak is over, and I woke up in a cold sweat. Talk about frightening dreams. Well, here we are. It's Wednesday. We're in the Torch Center, and thank God, with the help of the Almighty, we are recording a brand new Parsha podcast, staving off nightmares worldwide, keeping the streak alive. Let's go. This week is Parsha's Shlach, and of course the majority of the Parsha deals with the ill-fated reconnaissance mission of Moshe sending 12 ostensibly really righteous and pious heads of the tribe to go scout out and reconnoiter the land, and it is a disaster, and the nation is condemned to spend 40 years wandering in the wilderness. That's the beginning of the Parsha, and most of the Parsha. At the very end of the Parsha, the last five verses of the Parsha contain the third paragraph of the Shema. And it tells us a beautiful mitzvah. A mitzvah that is equal to all the 613 mitzvahs combined. And that is that we must wear tzitzis, fringes, on all four corners of our four-corner garments. If you have a three-corner garment, you don't need tzitzis. But with a four-corner garment, you should apply tzitzis, fringes upon the corners. And the way the mitzvah is portrayed for us is that there are strings, regular strings, white strings. And there's also another string, an extra string of tcheles wool, of blue dyed wool wrapped around it. And if you read these verses, very beautiful verses. You should have the tzitzis, and you should see the tzitzis, and you should remember all the mitzvahs of God, and you'll do them, and you won't deviate, not after your heart and not after your eyes, and you'll remember all the mitzvahs and do all of them, and be holy to Hashem your God. I am Hashem your God, who took you out of the land of Egypt to be for you a God. I am Hashem, and thus the parsha ends. A beautiful set of verses, a very powerful mitzvah. And there's more. The Talmud tells us that this is such an important mitzvah. Like we mentioned, it's equal to all the mitzvahs combined. This one mitzvah is emblematic of all of Torah. This embodies what Torah is all about. And the Talmud, the book of Shabbos, page 32b, tells us if someone is careful and fastidious in this mitzvah of tzitzis, they will merit and have 2,800 attendants taking care of them. And the Talmud of the Book of Menachos, page 43b, tells us that if someone is fastidious and careful and meticulous in this mitzvah, he will merit to see the face of the Shechina. He will merit to bask in the divine presence. Just this year, I saw a interesting and powerful and evocative statement in the Zohar. The Zohar compares the mitzvah of tzitzis to a bulletproof vest. When a person wraps themselves with the tzitzis, with the garment of tzitzis, and goes out of his house, the Almighty is happy, and the angel who wants to destroy him is banished, and the person is saved from all danger, from all damaging and all destruction. And that will ensure that your home will be peaceful and complete. So we have this very beautiful mitzvah, the mitzvah of tzitzis, the white strings, and then there's the treles, the one blue dyed wool string. Now, it's important to note that this can only be fulfilled with a specific blue dye that comes from a mysterious aquatic creature called a chilazon. And for 1500 years, no one had or even claimed to have had this chilazon and the blue string. So this was a mitzvah or a part of the mitzvah, the blue string on top of the white strings that no one fulfilled for a long time. And in recent years, the Chila zone was rediscovered, or at least that's the claim. And this is still hotly contested. But if you're interested, I did do a Jewish history podcast episode on one of my other channels. So, of course, the Parsha podcast audience knows that the Parsha podcast, even though it may be the best of the podcast that I do, it's not the only one. I do a Jewish history podcast as well, amongst others. And I did an episode on the history of the Chilas. Give it a listen. Now, personally, 
I am convinced that we have found the real Tcheles, and indeed, I do wear the blue strings on my tzitzis and on my talus. But this, too, is part of the mitzvah. And this special blue string is pregnant with meaning and symbolism. The Talmud tells us, the book of Sota, page 17a, why do we have this blue string on our tzitzis? Because this Tcheles, this blue, is similar to the sea. And the sea is similar to the heavens, to the firmament. And the heavens, that is similar to God's throne of glory. And thus, by us wearing the tzitzis with the blue string with the tcheles, we remember God. So what do we have? We have this beautiful mitzvah at the end of our parsha. We have the white strings and the blue strings. And those two together are this mitzvah that will make us remember God and make us do the mitzvahs and become holy to him. But this is the issue I want to investigate a bit further. The Talmud tells us that the reason why we have a blue string, specifically blue, is because blue is similar to the sea. And the sea is similar to the heavens. And the heavens are similar to God's throne of glory. And thus, we see the tzitzis, and we see the blue string, and we remember God, and we remember his mitzvahs, and we do the mitzvahs, and we don't deviate after our hearts, not after our eyes, and we become holy to the Almighty. This Talmud is very perplexing. It takes a very circuitous route to get to the destination. It doesn't say, hey, if you look at your blue string, you'll remember God. That's not how it works. It doesn't go direct. There's many junctures along the way. You see the blue string, And that will make you think of the sea. And then once you're thinking about the sea, that will remind you of heaven, of the firmament, of the sky. And when you think of the heaven and the firmament and the sky, you'll remember God's throne of glory. This is a very interesting Talmud that warrants an investigation. What is the deeper meaning behind this multi-station journey? I did see a Midrash that has an even more elaborate journey. It says, why do we have a blue string? Because the blue will remind us of the weeds, and the weeds will remind us of the sea, and the sea will remind us of the firmament, and the firmament will remind us of the rainbow, and the rainbow will remind us of the cloud, and the cloud will remind us of God's throne of glory, and that will connect us to him. This is a very perplexing idea. You would think that if there's some power in the tzitzis and the tchelas, the blue string, to remind you of God, well, just say it like that. If you look at the string, it will remind you of God and you'll remember God and his mitzvahs and you'll do them. You won't even it after your heart and your eyes. And you'll become holy to God. He took us out of Egypt. He is our God. But no, the Talmud tells us, you see this and it'll remind you of that. And you see that, and it'll remind you of that and that to that. And eventually you will arrive at the destination. You will be, so to speak, envisioning the throne of glory and that will bind you with the Almighty. So this is an interesting question to ponder. And I did see a nice answer, a basic answer, I would say, that in our ascent to heaven, we can't skip any steps. We can't jump straight to the throne of glory. We have to go level upon level, step by step, and not try to skip any steps. But today, in this special edition of the Parsha podcast, I want to suggest a new approach. And this approach, the core of it, I saw in my grandfather's writings, but please God, we're going to expand upon it and connect it to some of the other ideas of the parasha. And I think it will provide us a very valuable framework for understanding how we are to maximize our potential in our life. Are you ready? Let's go. So let's look at these verses once again. The verse tells us that we should make the tzitzis and we should have these strings on the corners of our garments. And we have the white strings, and then we also have the blue string. And that shall be for us as tzitzis. And we should see them and remember all the mitzvahs of Hashem, our God. And we shall do them. And we shall not deviate after our hearts and after our eyes that are trying to seduce us to sin. What this tells us is that the objective of the tzitzis is to, yes, do something positive and to avoid doing something negative. The positive is, you see it, and you remember the mitzvahs, and you do them. 
And that's a positive benefit that we get from tzitzis. But there's also a prophylactic. By doing that, seeing the tzitzis and remembering God and his mitzvot and doing them, we're going to avoid the negative and we're not going to deviate after our hearts and our eyes and we're not going to sin. This is a very important structure provided to us by this verse. And I think we must examine it very carefully. This verse describes for us the anatomy of sin. We think of sin, a violation, so to speak, of our covenant with God, as something quite straightforward. Hey, you do a sin, and that's it. The decision's done, end of story, and that's it. But if you look at this verse, and especially with the Rashi commentary, you see that it's something entirely different. Rashi tells us that the verse is describing both a positive process, remembering the mitzvos, doing them, and also avoiding a negative process, not deviating after our hearts and after our eyes. And Rashi tells us that the heart and the eyes, they're not the ones that do the sin, but they're like facilitators of sin. And he explains, the way it actually works is as follows. The eye sees, and that's the initiation of a certain process, and the heart desires, and the body executes and sins. Sin, Rashi tells us, is the result of an unholy alliance of the eyes, the heart, and the body. The eyes see, and that creates a desire, a lust in the heart, but that's still not enough to have a sin. It's only once the body acts upon that lust, that is the sin. The sin is the result of a long and almost convoluted process. It starts with the eyes, it progresses into a desire in the heart, And that culminates in a sin actualized by the body. This Rashi is breaking down sin into its individual components. There are a lot of factors that go into making a sin. If you wanted to create a strategy to avoid sinning, you could do it really at three different junctures. If a sin is a combination of the eyes, the heart, and the body. The eyes sees, the heart desires, and the body sins. You could stop the sin. You could avoid it also at three different junctures. The eyes, if you don't see something, and then it won't start the process. But even if you did see something, you could try to stop it at the heart to not desire what you see. And if you saw something and you desired it, you could stop it at the third level, at the body, not acting upon that desire. But here's the key point. Once there is a robust lust in the heart, once you're already very much down this road, down this progression, you have a lot of momentum, it's actually very hard to stop it. It's very hard to avoid sinning. To do that demands superhuman-like tenacity and strength of character and fortitude to avoid sinning. So what's this verse advising us to do? See the tzitzis and not sin. And avoid the whole process to not deviate after your heart and your eyes and thereby be holy to God. Let's take this a little bit further. There are many, many sources in Jewish literature to the effect that a man should not ogle and gaze at things that are even tangentially related to sin, or else it can cause him to indeed sin. And the idea behind that is the same format that we find in this verse. The eye sees, the heart desires, the body sins. And therefore, if you don't look at things that could potentially lead you down this bad path, if you avoid looking at those things, well, then you'll avoid the sin at the end of that process. 
But there's another deep point here. We're told to not even see something which is associated with sin. It's not like, hey, don't examine, don't look, don't ogle, don't gaze upon sin itself, because that could lead your heart to desire and your body to sin. It says don't even look at things that are even associated tangentially and remotely to sin, because that can eventually lead you down that path. Once your imagination is set to work, your mind jumps from thing to thing, and in an almost unguided, random fashion, you end up at a destination. So if you see something that's even remotely associated with sin, that can put you on a path from thinking about something to thinking about something else to fomenting a desire in the heart that ultimately result in sinning of the body. And of course, all humans have had this experience. You think about one thing, and that reminds you of something else, and you start fantasizing about a third thing and a fourth thing, and in our reverie, in our daydream, we end up in a place that's almost unrecognizable from the starting point. And that could be very dangerous. Your mind, your superpower, is being led by this monkey brain, this lizard brain, And that's driving the vehicle and you could crash and that could be a disaster. And that's what we're up against. Your eyes, once they see something, the heart can foment this desire. And even if what you see is not the sin, you could get there and therefore you must avoid or you're encouraged to avoid seeing things even if they're not directly related to sin, even if they're only tangentially related. How is this all combated? What is the antidote to the harmful, uncontrolled imagination that can lead to sin? The way we avoid this problem is by hijacking it. We hijack this process for good. What this verse is telling us is something fascinating. Normally, Your mind sees something and you start thinking about one thing and you go start thinking about something else and before you know it, you're thinking about very unpleasant thoughts and once that process is sent into motion, it's very hard to stop the train. But this verse is revealing to us that there is a productive and beneficial uncontrolled imagination that can actually lead us to very good places. That is the trellis. It's blue. Oh, what else is blue? Ah, the sea is blue. If you see like the sea or the ocean, it's blue water. It's such beautiful water. Oh, what else is blue? Oh, the sky, beautiful blue sky. The firmament is blue. Oh, and you start thinking about heaven. And suddenly you remember God and his throne of glory and your reverie, your Daydream, your mind wandering on its own, ends up at the throne of glory of God. This is the identical process of the eye sees something sketchy that can cause the heart to foment and there's a desire and the body executes upon that desire. This is the exact opposite. The eye sees something positive and the heart foments a desire that's very positive. And then you do all the mitzvahs of Hashem, your God. The body acts upon those desires. So we have, in one verse, two opposing processes. Again, they're mirror images of each other. It starts off with seeing something either good or bad, and that can lead you down a process that's either very good or very bad. And tzitzis, and the the power of tzitzis and the power of tcheles is to take us down the good kind of reverie, the good kind of daydreaming, the good kind of uncontrolled thoughts that lead from thing to thing, the blue to the blue to the blue to the sky, from the sea to the sky to the heaven to the throne, to God. And that is creating a desire, a positive desire in your heart. And then you go about and you execute it with your body. You implement it and you become holy to God. It's an amazing idea that we see over here. Your eyes are going to see something. In this verse, we're told, let your eyes see the trellis. And let it begin this process of your mind jumping from thing to thing. 
and the destination is going to be God's throne. And once that desire is firmly entrenched in your heart, then you will do the mitzvahs because then the process has already begun, the desire is already there, and you'll become holy to Hashem, your God. This verse can now be read in a much deeper fashion. It shall be for you, Fetzitzis, and you should see them. And that is something that you see and you start wandering with your mind in an uncontrolled way. And you start daydreaming in very healthy ways and arriving at a very desirable and cherished and holy place. And then you remember the mitzvah of Hashem, your God, and you do them. And you should not, you should avoid the other way, to not deviate after your heart and your eyes, that could cause you to sin. Your mind is perhaps a slippery thing. It can lead you to very unusual places. And there are two very opposing ways that this can happen. With the tzitzis and the blue thread, we are choosing to have the helpful, productive, beneficial, holy reverie, and not the other one where the eye sees and the heart desires and the body sins. There's some very advanced and very powerful and very useful ideas over here. And I want to take it yet a step further. In every project, there are two phases. There's the planning phase and then there's the implementation, the execution phase. You have the the blueprint You have the sketch, you have the dream, you have the roadmap, you have the vision. And then there's the implementation of that dream. There's the actual construction of that blueprint. There is the implementation, execution of the roadmap, the vision, the plan. This verse is telling us that the eyes and the heart are creating a roadmap. And the body is the so to speak, executive branch that implements that roadmap. And once you have a plan, once your eyes have created a certain portal and you've fomented a desire, then the implementation is really about kind of tracing, so to speak, those lines, the lines of that sketch, following that plan step by step. You can have a dream and make it happen. Once the dream is outlined, you have a roadmap, and you know where you want to go, now it's time to go there. This mitzvah is telling us that by gazing at the tzitzis and at the threat of tchelas, we can make our dreams, our roadmap, our aspirations, our destination, they can arrive all the way at God's throne of glory. And of course, this would prevent us from having a roadmap with a decidedly different outcome, the eye sees, the heart desires, and the body sins. No. Instead, we're going to look at the senses of the trellis and dream and fantasize about the throne of glory of God. And eventually, we're going to get there. And that's the follow-up verse. We will do the mitzvahs of Hashem and we will become holy to God. Once the process gets started on the right foot, once we have the big dreams and aspirations and roadmaps and we put in the effort to implement the plan, we will get there and become holy to God. Dreams, the roadmap, the big plans, that is paramount because that's the beginning of the journey and we must dream big. The Midrash exhorts us that we must say And we must hope that our deeds will match the deeds of our forefathers, Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. Abram, Isaac, and Jacob, the titans, the founders of our people, giants of men. Each one of us, small people, regular people, lay people, individuals living in modern times. We all have to say and hope and say, when will I finally be like Abram, like Isaac, and Jacob? Will that actually happen? Will I become like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Will you become like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? I hate to break it to you, but it's very doubtful. But nevertheless, there's no excuse to not have that dream. There's no excuse to not dream about God's throne of glory. And we have to remember, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they are our antecedents. 
And therefore, that should imbue all of us with a confidence that nothing is impossible. Dream really, really big and go for it. And on the flip side, the bad dreams are very destructive. The Talmud tells us in the book of Yoma, page 39a, that fantasizing about sin is actually harsher than the sin itself. Because the fantasy is the roadmap, it's the dream, it's what you seek and what you go after. The sin itself, that could be an aberration. But the dream, the plan, that is a person's identity. And therefore, the dream itself is much more harmful and destructive than the sin itself. And this is the lesson of the Tchelos. This is the lesson of the Tzitzis. You, my dear friend, you, my fellow human, you are dreaming anyhow. It's your choice what you're dreaming about. And here we're told you have to dream good, good dreams, not bad dreams. And you have to dream big, not small, not small dreams. Dream. Let your mind wander in a productive fashion. Envision yourself as a success, as a resounding success in whatever field that you are aspiring to. And once you have that dream, now it is feasible. Let's go back to the beginning of the Parsha. I want to speculate that this precisely was the mistake of the spies. You know, it's probably not a coincidence that the verse that talks about the tzitzis is found in the same parsha that talks about the grave blunder of the spies. These spies, they reconnoiter the land for 40 days and they return with a devastating report. Although they acknowledge that the land is indeed flowing with milk and honey, they report that its people are fearsome and mighty and its defenses are impregnable and conquering it is impossible. We were walking and there were giants and they saw us and we felt like grasshoppers compared to them. And that's how they looked at us. This is chapter 13, verse 33. The spies went to look at the land and they saw that it was indeed impossible to conquer. Under the way things were, the people of the land were too mighty and it would be irrational to think that we can triumph over them. Compared to them, we're like grasshoppers. And that assessment was accurate. But you know what else is accurate? It's accurate for me to tell you, you will never be like Abraham. But nevertheless, you have to dream to be like Abraham. It's also accurate for me to tell you, you'll never arrive at God's throne of glory. That's where like Moses is. You'll never get there. Is that accurate? Yes. Is it irrational for me to tell you you'll never get there? Yes. But nevertheless, the Tchelos tells us, dream big. We must say that I hope I could be like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The spies forgot the lesson of the Tchelos. You must Dream the biggest dreams possible. And you know what? Once you have that dream, now your life is going to be oriented to try to implement that. If you dream about God's throne, you will become holy to God. These spies, they missed that lesson. They let others set their expectation and standards. They refused to be irrational. And that's why they blundered. It's kind of an amazing thing. You see immigrants who come to this country and they have a basic rudimentary English at best and they have a very limited education and they become multimillionaires. But Americans who were born here, who speak the language, who are highly educated, very talented, they often feel incapable Scared, frightened, uncertain. They don't seem to be able to make it. And here's the reason why. If you were told that you can't do it, if you were told what all the problems with a certain pursuit, if all you know are the things that stop you from doing it, you have to unlearn all of that before you can dream big. 
Tchelas, Tzitzis, tells us we have to daydream a little bit. We have to suspend our rationality and think about very positive things, even if they're a little bit irrational and outlandish. We have to envision ourselves as becoming like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as becoming people who are worthy, who are meritorious to be in God's inner circle. We have to dream that I could become like Steve Jobs. Why? Is he any more talented than me? That's ridiculous. That's outrageous. You'll never become like Jeff Bezos. Of course, this is these are great uh, entrepreneurs who built great companies. But whatever it is, whatever success that you want, the only way to get there is to be a little bit irrational. Let your thoughts wander to really good places. Dream really, really big. Dream of the highest, loftiest, most ethereal place. Dream of heaven and God's throne. And you set that destination in your life's GPS. And then you just go get them. Banish the naysayers. Eradicate the imposter syndrome. All the obstacles are nothing. And like Joshua and Caleb said, these people are nothing. These mighty fortresses, these giants are nothing. We can carve them up like bread. They're not going to stop us. That is the attitude of the Tchelas. Dream big. Be a little bit irrational. That's okay. And then you have a fighting chance to execute upon those dreams and become holy to Hashem, your God. Okay, let's get to this week's A&Q. Drum roll, please. A&Q. If we had a production assistant here or an audio technician, I would add like some sort of jingle or like a drum roll or some sort of audio effect. But of course, it's just me. I do all the editing and all the audio production, and it's just me in the Torch Center working on a shoestring budget. So I'm sorry. I apologize. We don't have a drum roll. So play a drum roll in your head. Okay, here's the question. In the aftermath of the sin of the spies, like the sin of the golden calf, God says, I'm going to destroy them. And Moshe intervenes and he starts praying. And God says, you know what? I've forgiven them as per your request. However, and this is chapter 14, verse 21, nevertheless, I'm making a promise that all the people who saw my honor and my signs and my wonders that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and they tested me 10 times and they didn't heed my voice, they are not going to see the land. And with the exception of Caleb and Joshua, they're all going to die and 40 Days of scouting the land will result in 40 years of wandering in the wilderness and the next generation will conquer the land. But here's where I want to zone in on. Chapter 14, verse 24. Ve'avdi Kalev and my servant Caleb, because he had a different spirit and he remained loyal to me, he is indeed going to enter the land and his offspring will hold it as a possession. So Caleb is different. He had a different spirit, and therefore he is not going to be included in the decree of not entering and conquering the land. What does it mean that Caleb had a different spirit? So if you read Rashi, there's a very surprising Rashi. What does it mean that Caleb had a different spirit? He had two spirits. One of his mouth, and one of his heart. Echad bepeh, one in his mouth, ve'echad belev, and one in his heart. To the other spies, he said, in his mouth, I'm with you, I'm part of this plot. I'm part of this mutinous crew to try to torpedo the conquest of Canaan. That's how he portrayed himself, with his mouth. However, in his heart, he said the truth. And because Caleb had this extra spirit, he was one in his mouth and one in his heart. His mouth and his heart were divorced and decoupled from each other. Because he was deceptive to the spies, he portrayed himself as a collaborator, but he had a different spirit in his heart. He had two spirits. Perhaps in common parlance, we'd call him two-faced, but of the good type. And he was so noble and so laudable, he's not going to be punished. He indeed will enter the land and 
inherit it. Caleb is so righteous. He had two spirits, one in the heart and one in the mouth, and that's why he won't be punished. To the contrary, he will be handsomely rewarded. And here's the question. All the way back in Genesis chapter 37, verse 4, this is when we're reading about the scuffle and the conflict between Joseph and his brothers. Joseph is beloved by his father. His father makes him the special tunic. And the brothers see that Joseph is more beloved in the eyes of Jacob than all the rest of the brothers. And they hated him. And they could not speak to him any positive words. Chapter 37, verse 4. And Rashi, in his comment, says something which seems to be entirely contradictory to what he says over here about Caleb. The brothers could not speak anything positive about Joseph, says Rashi, amidst their shame and their criticism or the criticism about them, we also learn their praise. That they did not speak they did not speak one in the mouth and one in the heart. The brothers, they hated Joseph and they couldn't speak positively to him. Their hearts and their mouth were united. They hated him in their heart and they did not present themselves in their mouth differently. They couldn't speak to him positively. So here's the question. Is being two-faced a good thing or a bad thing? Caleb is praised for being two-faced. He's one in the heart and one in the mouth. And the brothers are being praised for not being two-faced. It's just an amazing thing. The identical words in Rashi, one in the mouth and one in the heart, are used in opposite ways. With Caleb, he is praised for being one in the mouth and one in the heart. And the brothers of Joseph are being praised for not being one in the mouth and one in the heart. And here's the question. Is being two-faced a good thing? How could it be that when Caleb does it, it's praised, and when the opposite is done by the brothers, that too is praised? If you have an answer to this week's question, this week's a and send me an email, rabbiwalby at gmail.com. Okay, last week we asked a very tough question. The question we asked last week is, what is the meaning of the three things? Number one, the cover slash lid of the ark that had the cherubs on top of it and the menorah and Moshe's trumpets that must be hewn and hammered and pounded out of a single block of metal. Why these three things specifically can't be cast, can't be poured into a mold, can't be welded, must be hewn out of a single block of metal. This is a very tough question. One of the listeners who responded and emailed me, rabbiwalbajima.com, one of the listeners speculated that the answer might be so profound and multifaceted that it would merit an entire book. And I actually toyed with teasing you. I wanted to tease you. Could you believe it? I wanted to say that, hey, listen, saying I don't know is a very good answer. The Talmud, in fact, says that a person should train themselves to always say I don't know. But I decided, you have been so loyal to me. We're such good friends. This is the Parsha podcast, after all. I can't tease you. I can't. We're too close. We're too friendly. You're too beloved to me. I cannot do that to you. So here's my speculation on this question. So first of all, I remembered that there is another thing that we must create, that we're told it must be created in the exact opposite fashion, meaning that it cannot be hammered out of a pre-existing piece. It must be made from something that was previously unmade. And that is the sukkah. We're told you have to make a sukkah and you cannot carve out a sukkah. Let's say you have a mound of trees. You can't just carve out a hole and in the hole, so to speak, you have the sukkah and you've made a sukkah by removing something that would have stopped it from being a sukkah. And this got me thinking 
that perhaps we can say that there are two ways to build something. There is the sukkah way of building something, actively creating the thing that you want to make. And then there's the menorah slash cover slash trumpets way, not actually touching the thing that you want to make, but removing all the things that inhibit it, scraping away the contaminants, and what's left and not removed is the thing that you want. You chisel away at all the things that are not the desired outcome, and what's left is the desired outcome. There is a creation of commission, and there is a creation of omission. And these three things that must be hammered out out of pre-existing material, speculation is, that they symbolize three things that we already have within us. We don't need to go out and acquire it. We just need to remove the contaminants, and it's there. Let's start with the cover of the Ark. The cover of the Ark with the cherubs symbolizes the relationship that we have with the Almighty. It's like lovers who want to hug each other. We already have a deep relationship with God. We just need to remove the contaminants that disrupt that. The menorah symbolizes our ability to take the light of Torah and illuminate the world. And like the cover of the ark, we already have the ability to influence the world, provided that we remove the contaminants. The trumpets are used to hail Moshe, the king of the Jews. He uses them to assemble the people and to indicate movement and decamping. Moshe, like all leaders and truthfully all people, already have the greatness within them. We already have the greatness and leadership within us, provided that we remove the contaminants. These three things are representative of achievements that are baked within us. We just need to clear away the contaminants. That's the theory. That's the speculation. Whereas the sukkah, what it symbolizes is about creating something that did not exist hitherto. It cannot be hammered out of something that exists. It's the creation of something new. Why is that so? Why is the sukkah the creation of something that never existed previously? To know the answer to that, you have to listen to the podcasts that I did on the sukkah. That much, even though we're such best buds, I feel like I still can tease you about that. So give it a listen. That is my speculation to last week's a and I thank you for listening. I thank you for your friendship and your support and your generosity that you have extended to me and to the team here at Torch, signing off from the Torch Center. This is Rabbi Yaakov Wolby. I thank you for listening. Listen to all my podcasts. Have an amazing rest of your week. Have a fantastic, awesome, wonderful, splendid upcoming Shabbos. And please, God, with the help of the Almighty, we will talk again next week.